There he is. I just put it in here. So um, about 38 years ago, I started selling houses when I got out of college. And uh, over the years, I started noticing patterns in the neighborhoods that certain houses would sell more frequently than others. And it was not only common in Boulder, Colorado, but it was also common in California. So about four years ago, I, uh, when I went back to graduate school, the uh, professors were the same age I was, and we were drinking a lot of beer together. And I had called them back, and I said, you know, Mike, I think we really have something here. We have patterns that we see in the marketplace, but I just wondered if there's any mathematical modeling that we could put to it so that we could replicate it across the country and determine if there was a state of change that was occurring because a rippling effect of change inside of a micro community. And so about four years ago, we started this with uh, two PhDs, and we started uh, filing our patent for the ability to rank and score properties across the country, which we filed two and a half years ago, which we have the original art on. And so what we're looking at is the ability to quantify 93 million houses across the country and see if there are certain patterns that exist that cause certain things to happen. And we have data from here to Bakersfield and back, and some of it as deep as, as uh, Fresno. And it's it, the kind of data that we look at is uh, various kinds of housing characteristics, financial characteristics, deed characteristics that we try to look at to see whether or not we can predict who's going to be able to do that. So when we filed our original papers for our patent, we were able to predict around 47% of all the future transactions in about 20% of the houses. And the ramification from that is, is that no longer are you trying to market to every single house. If every chair was a house, you wouldn't market to those anymore. And you'd only focus on the ones that are most likely. Well, as you go up the chain from the 20% to the 10 and the 5, it even got stronger and stronger. So we're somewhere between three to 400 times more likely to determine whether or not somebody is going to make some type of change in the future. Well, what we also discovered is that not only do you say to change in terms of whether or not they're going to sell, but when they go into that state, they also make uh, alterations in the relationships where they have with people. So they may go out to a big box store like Home Depot and buy lots of furniture, or they may change their insurance agent. If we're able to predict that, you can imagine what we can do with that kind of information. So we sell that information across the country. And uh, one of the things that we wanted to do is to, with Barrett's help, is to validate that information and then be able to enhance it to the next level, taking cloud information and bringing it on top of the roof cloth and seeing what we could do by altering how people invest their capital in certain types of bonds, what type of house they should buy, who should move, who shouldn't move. And so that's the underpinning, and we love this stuff. So we're passionate about it, and, and uh, you get great cookies, and um, a lot of great cookies, and we have, we have beer on Friday. And uh, if you like to play golf, we'll teach you how to play golf as well. But I, we wanted to come today to present to show you that there's opportunities of taking this data and not only applying it in the United States, but anywhere in the f world that has private property rights, we think that there's characteristics that we can measure. And if we can predict that, we can predict land usages, land absorption, all kinds of other fun stuff. And so you just get into it, you start to think about it, man, man, if we're able to discover what's going to happen just on these characteristics, what are the things we could do with it? So. I wanted to have Matt come up, and uh, since he's probably more your age than my age, um, he can tell you a little bit about what we're doing and uh, any thoughts or ideas that will be around here or answer any questions for you. Again, thanks for your time, guys. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> Everybody got cookies. All right. Well, t Terry did a pretty good job of summing it. I don't know what I can add to that. I Technically, I can tell you what, what, what we have. We have a 11-factor, uh, for the most part, uh, forecasting model. Uh, the 11 factors are distilled from 187 characteristics of homes that we know. And with that, we produce a ranked list every single month 
with a likelihood or a less less likelihood of selling uh, in a given time period. And I don't want to I don't want to cloud anybody by giving too much of our sales pitch because uh, one of the things we'd like you to do is we'd like to look get you to look at it as, and see if you can validate what we have and see if we're wrong. Um, what uh, what we would like to do technically is we'd like to first provide you uh, a series of monthly analysis, get you to uh, look at the factors that we bring in there, see if you can predict a model uh, that works within the factors, and then as Terry was saying, see if you can extrapolate from that and expand upon it uh, and see if there's anything that we can do to improve it. Uh, I'll tell you personally, this is a kind of an interesting one for me because I, I don't know how, I've never been in a data mining class before, but I, I, I'm, I love math. And when our PhD spoke to me, I, I said, what was it that got me passionate about this project? Uh, what, got pa what got me passionate about it was actually the movie Pi. We've all seen it, I know we have. Uh, I thought it was a fascinating idea that, and we all know this is all kind of old hat, that the financial markets can be predicted. Uh, what I saw with the real estate industry was that everybody always talked about the person, the person, the person. And with this, without knowing anything specifically about a person, we're able to predict a major life change. And that just it got me hooked. Uh, and so we've been doing it for about three years. Uh, we want to find somebody who's passionate, who's interested in this type of mathematics, behavioral prediction without, for the most part right now, much uh, demographic information about an individual. Uh, it's unique in the industry. Nobody else is, is doing it. We are patent pending. We will be uh, you know, at the forefront of this. And uh, we really are looking to first solidify our position now and then find people who can possibly provide insight into further developments. And Barron's offered to uh, assist with that, uh, but has also suggested that you are some of the cream of the crop and that you might be able to provide that to us. So I don't know if it's typical here to ask to provide for questions. Is oh, yeah, no, they, they ask questions. The one thing I want to Darn. clarify is, no, no, you can't, no, they, they all ask, they'll ask questions. Oh, OK. Um, but the main thing is what they're doing is most all real estate data is done on a um, macro level. And that's very hard to predict. And then you, the, the government does things and you do trends. What's really interesting about their model is they're doing it at the micro level. So what's the likelihood of this house selling in this given period of time based on factors of you know, age, demographics, location. And that's that's what makes it really interesting is that things here, they're, they're tackling the problem at the micro level. Mm -hmm. So they can give a list of potential home sales to realtors and preempt everybody else, but also say, you know, this is what the trends are in this local area. And that's what makes this so interesting. It's because they're looking at it at the micro level where everybody else generally looks at it Right. Let, me, let me give you an example of how important it is. If you were sending out a piece of mail to your house, the chances of you responding are less than a quarter of one percent. It's nothing. Okay, so the cost is phenomenal. But when they use our math, it goes from that number to three percent, four percent, five percent. We have the last week we had a three percent response rate within twenty four hours. That means you got your postcard, you take an eight digit code, you went back to the website, and we identified you. You're not Mickey Mouse, you're not Donald Duck, you're Fred and Martha Stewart who live at this house. We know everything about you at that place. That's phenomenal. You, you can't find that anywhere in the world right now. So we know that our math is working. Don't, don't scare people by telling them we know everything about you in that house. <laughs> <laughs> we know a lot of <laughs> They're going to be running to the internet to see if they can lock down their personal information. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, you know, and, and, and the nice thing about it is, is we're only beginning with this information. We're just really getting into it. Right. We're not really sure all the things that we have discovered, but the two original people that worked there spent their entire life based upon the theory that there is a uh, there are certain types of uh, feasibility programs that involve capital in search of an opportunity, a seller in search of a buyer, and a buyer in search of a seller, and taking that locational information that really changes the world. And uh, it's out of Wisconsin, uh, out of the business school there, and, uh, and it's fun stuff. And, and yeah, I don't want to add any more. I want to get some questions for you because I hope there are some questions. This is, uh, 
if you think already, I'm sure some of you are putting in your head, what can you use this for? We're talking about real estate. That's our low-hanging fruit. Of course, realtors in the real estate industry are the initial places. But understand everything else that goes along with the transaction of a single house. They say that a trans every house that sells makes one job. There are other things that happen at that time uh, during real estate transactions that affect, that ripple effects across the entire market uh, in an entire community. And so our information, our low-hanging fruit, our initial clients, of course, are realtors, lenders, things like that. Uh, but the ramifications for something of this, if it, if it can be validated, if we can validate it, if we can improve upon it, um, we're talking about a brand new way of interacting with the economy as, as we know it. It's just a marketing, of course, but forecasting, budgeting, anything in the finance world that would have to do with this, it's, it's really what keeps me going on this. So um, I hope it piqued your interest and I hope it gets a question at, at least. Correct. We're talking about a house that has no, has we have no previous knowledge of their interest to sell. There are websites out there that do clicks and count clicks, and, and Barrett was talking about the the ability to. We we're talking about no previous inclination to sell, no contact. We predict it. And it's trillion dollar industry. I mean, it's, it, it's very fractured. The information is fractured. It, it's, uh, we happen to have a depository of that information that very few people have because of the relationship that we have with certain people. Absolutely. Yeah. And so by taking that information, and now we've got a lot of people who are really interested in adding other information on top of ours to see what would that do to make it even that much better. Well, what other applications we could do with it? They have fun with it. Did you have a follow up? In fact, well, the thing is, we we know a lot, but our algorithm is not based off of any particular financial, age, demographics, uh, you know, anything. It, basically, any of the stuff you'd get from the census, not there. We're talking for the most part public record data, the the, the sales, size of the house. Geospatial. What we've found is that there's a trend geospatially around properties, and that while we think this is a deep personal decision, yeah. it actually isn't. You are actually driven by external forces. And you can all think about this. You get the sense. Your next door neighbor sells their house for $1.5 million. You thought it was worth a million. That's going to change your opinion. You might, wait, I, I cash out. Regardless of where your financial situation is, within, within reason, obviously, if you're underwater. But that's the type, that's where we came at. We said, look, we can't get personal information, but we can get this other stuff. Can we predict a trend? And we do that pretty well. Um, and, as I, and I don't want to give a time limit. As I said, I'm trying to be a little vague because I, I don't want to cloud it. If you do grab the project, I want you to go in relatively blind with the data. We'll give you some focus, but see if you can what you find. Because um, you might create something completely different based off of what we had as the foundation for a, a greater understanding of your own. Yes? Well, we have three, there are three basic elements that you have for, for real estate data. There's the assessment data, that's your tax record data, there's the financial data, and then there's any uh, mortgage information. There's three basic. For, house, for any house, right. So you have, you have what's the assessor taxing you on and, and has your basic public information. What are your deeds, uh, the deed transaction of the sale, and then lending information. Mm -hmm. In that, we have over 200 data elements. We actually don't use all of those. We've taken that down to, I think, somewhere around, you'll have to forgive me, I don't know all of them, but I think it's 87 or so. Those are then distilled down to 11. So you only take the numbers that Well, we take, we, we, when we go actually into the model, into the, into the, it actually is only 11 <laughs> characteristics, but those are, some of those are raw from the 87, I think, of course, like house size is carried directly in there. But other ones are actually distilled from a combination before that of those 87 down to, you know, new unique data elements. Mm -hmm. 
We do. Yeah. Right. And it's, it, it's done. Uh, we, it, it's done through a, a GIS program. A lot of it's, again, based, it, it's based in a geospatial analysis. So um, we might create a characteristic based off of uh, the average size of houses, um, average sale price, combine it with, um, with growth of sales or something like that and, and create an, a unique key. I'm just making those up, but that's the idea, right? Of course. We're ranking the house. Right. As you say, the, 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 I was just making sure. So one last element that to to why this is up is so the things like public records like housing permits and thank you. Sure. A guy named Ken Rosen, who became head of the real estate department at UC Berkeley, basically built his whole company on analytics, and that's how powerful it was because he could predict what rents would be in the commercial space. And so there is a fact that Cookies are very good. Thank you. <laughs> nice to meet you. Oh, no, they're like, <laughs> yeah, we're going to, but we're going to get you. Here's, let me give you my cards. And you can always contact and also. Yeah. Absolutely. Nice to meet you guys. There's a couple more. Thank you. Very interesting. Thanks a lot. We'll keep the cookies. Okay. <laughs> Great question. Yeah. We wouldn't want to bribe you or anything. Right. <laughs> Thank you very much.
Thanks a lot. Okay, well, um, that obviously is another project that you guys could get involved with. Uh, I think there's already quite a bit of commitment on some of the earlier presentations, but if you haven't, um, please consider this. It uh, sounds like an interesting, interesting task. So um, in case you didn't notice, I'm not Ram, uh, and he is, he is off at a conference. And uh, so yesterday afternoon he said, oh, by the way, will you cover uh, information extraction tomorrow? And so I'm trying to cover, actually he provided the slides, so I'm stumbling through somebody else's slides uh, for, to a large extent. Uh, interesting short science fiction thing, I don't know if you've been looking at it. Uh, this is sort of the view of the the computers taking over the universe, and uh, the uh, that's that's often what people start thinking of these kinds of things when you start talking about information extraction. Um, in fact, what we're going to be looking at is a particularly constrained area of information extraction, primarily extraction from text. Um, it there are other information extraction methods which involve, for example, downsizing uh, relational databases. So they focus more exactly on the topics you're interested in. But um, that may, may, we may talk about a bit later, but we're focusing on information extraction today. So we saw that bit, but um, I'm going to skip through this. <laughs> so. Two kind, kinds of ways to deal with information. One is retrieval. That's the area I'm most familiar with, where the notion is you put in a query, you get back a set of documents, and hopefully the answer you're interested in is in those documents somewhere. Um, the other approach is attempting to do a kind of inference to say um, there are some associations between these bits of information and I want to find the person who has all of these associations that are in common with that. So for the one you basically do text processing and so on. For the other you have to have these sort of relationship indicators that say for advisor WC is the advisor of NL and YH is the advisor of TM and there's an affiliation of WC with a particular college and affiliation with uh, somebody else for uh, another college and that various of them have names and so on. So what we're interested in is uh, who does WC advise and who is uh, LTI? Yeah, anyway. Uh, as it works out, the only answer that, that satisfies all of those uh, items is a particular, one particular answer. So this notion is in effect what the semantic web wants to be built on to, to do that kind of inference amongst uh, zillions of triples over uh, an entire web scale set of little uh, inference things. Um, so I'm not sure where that was going. <laughs> the, um, but using, using machines to uh, merge information uh, is and has been important. Uh, part of what's involved in this, and it's very similar to the process of constructing a data warehouse, as it's called sometimes. You, you need to clean up your data, uh, rationalize it into a form that can be, uh, expresses what you're interested in. You, in fact, you just heard people saying, well, we have all these variables, we reduce them down to about 11 that we really deal with. And that's the sort of data cleaning and, and uh, 
and integration that needs to be done um, for things like this. So there are also standards for uh, data exchange, KQML, Keef, uh, Daml and Oil. Uh, in the semantic web, you've got OWL for ontologies um, and which is a, a, a big growth factor in the, in the net currently. Uh, everyone wants their own ontology. Uh, nobody likes anyone else's ontologies. So um, you have this constant growth. Um, but generally, the question is, what do we mean by information extraction, and particularly information extraction from text? Now, I believe that these were taken from Cohen and uh, Tom Mitchell. Um, so you start with a text, and what you want to do is fill slots in a database. We want to know who are the people here, what is their title in an organization, and which organization is that. So part of it involves trying to figure out what are the things that name organizations? What are the things that name people? What are the things that name positions that people hold within those organizations? So the whole task is to do the identification, then to extract those into a nice relational table you can use for easy lookup and so on. Um, the end user then can query across that relational representation to look at it. Now, what this involves is a number of steps. The first step is segmentation, which attempts to just identify, for example, nouns or proper nouns, named entities within this uh, body of text that you're dealing with. Then you need to classify those entities to decide, is this a person, is it an organization, uh, or is it a position? Uh, you may be using external sources for this. For example, a list of companies. Uh, if, some, if a name that you find in the text matches a company name, uh, it, that's your company. Um, your positions may just be a table that you generated, perhaps only the, only the positions you're interested in. Say you're only interested in the CEOs and CFOs and, and so on, so you would include only those in the table. Um, and then other named entities that you hopefully can figure out are proper nouns, uh, you can then extract as names. You then need to figure out which of these individual names that has been extracted is associated with the other facts that have been extracted. So you have this association task, which says, which usually looks at the structure of the text itself to try to say, okay, Bill Gates is connected as CEO of Microsoft. And um, when it mentions Gates and Microsoft again in the same sentence or same paragraph, you have that association again. And you start to combine those and merge them so that you know, Gates and Microsoft are determined to be equivalent of Bill Gates as CEO of Microsoft, and to be able to then merge those two together and perhaps even increase the weight of its evidence. Yeah. How do you how do you establish that relationship? Is it just based on co co-location of the words? Largely co-location, but um, what more commonly done? In fact, I can jump out of here and go to another. Uh, set of slides, but um, is to use some kind of natural language processing. Now, they, they have specialized NER not named entity uh, extraction uh, approaches that sort of uh, package some standard natural language processing techniques. They have or they have not? They have them, okay. yeah. There are some. Um, for example, I was reading today because actually this is related to what I was doing in another class earlier today. Uh, we've been looking at uh, applying natural language processing and information retrieval. And the biggest news in that arena these days, of course, is Watson. Uh, so 
Watson really is not a full natural language understanding system, but it's much more a system that uses information extraction and information retrieval and the sort of evidence combinations that we saw uh, in the example here to come up with a list of possible answers to the questions that they're looking for. Um, at the same time, what differentiates Watson from many of these other systems, instead of just kind of pulling something out and saying, okay, that's going to be our answer, what they do is generate information for all these answers, but also generate a confidence value for each one, and then rank them at the end by that confidence value. So um, it's the kind of thing that is getting to be common practice because uh, Watson and many other people who have worked in this field have been using this system called WEMA, uh, which I'm not remembering the exact meaning of the acronyms at the moment, but it's just U-I-M-A, um, which is a framework that was invented at IBM Research, but it is now open source through uh, the Apache uh, collection of things. And what it is intended to do is to give you a framework to put together all kinds of things like named entity extraction and so on as a pipeline for text processing. Um, so WEMA is one that has plugins for doing things like named entity extraction for organizations, people, and so on. It's pretty general, actually. It, any text <laughs> that you want to throw at it. Uh, it, you will need to fiddle with rules and so on for that kind of thing. But generally, uh, at least in English, proper nouns are pretty straightforward because they're all capitalized. Uh, so you know you can you can do that kind of thing. You know, it's it's not the first word in the sentence, or it's the first word in the sentence that's followed by another capitalized word or, or things like that. Um, the, so there's, there's some pretty simple rules that will work for, for proper nouns. Um, for more complex things, you can use a full-blown natural language processing, which actually diagrams sentences for you like was done in grammar school. In fact, uh, obviously, you can do this kind of stuff with web data, do screen scraping, uh, pull up the web pages, look at them. This, this particular case is, is trying to find job ads on the web. So uh, it puts up, you know, you do a query on, on job openings uh, for bakers, and it finds uh, various cases like Martin Baker, who's a person, uh, a genomics job, which is probably not for baking, uh, unless they're yeast genomics or something. Um, and then you may, may have employee job posting forms. So um, in many ways, retrieval is kind of a blunt instrument, and you need to refine the results to really do information extraction. Um, so what uh, people have done is to actually figure out ways to do this and to create companies that specialize in that. Flipdog is one that goes out and scours the web and pulls up job listings and pieces them all together into their website. Um, so that's the kind of thing that can be done uh, by basically extracting the information that they found on websites, putting it into the various slots that represent the things that they are interested in and want to allow you to search on, and therefore having a controlled database instead of just the free text, open text that you would find on, on a website or just on a web search engine. So if you're looking for a job opening in food services with the keyword baker and with a location in the continental United States, it will pull you up a whole bunch of things in the United States that have to do with baker's assistants and bakers and cooks for various things. So um, <clears throat> then you can do further data mining on the information you extracted. Actually, 
information extraction is very often the first step in your data mining task because you need to get it into some form that you can easily process. And information extraction is the way to do that. So more, more examples, many more examples. Uh, here are different sorts of uh, types of information extraction tasks. The simplest, or in some ways most difficult actually, one is just the plain unstructured text. You just look for particular patterns in the text itself and try to use that to extract information. Other types include where you may have some grammatical sentences like you would in a standard text, but also additional uh, identified or structured information associated with it. So phone numbers and contact information and things like that. Uh, then you may have non-grammatical snippets, things that are just fractional parts of sentences or just information that is not linguistic, linguistically structured at all. Um, and that may be a useful thing because it may be structured in a way that makes it easy to extract uh, the information. And finally, you have things like tables, which can be mined to extract various things in the tables, assuming you can figure out what the headers and the rows and columns represent. So um, the kind of things that you may be uh, mining from could be websites, uh, pulling information out of uh, web pages that, uh, that one actually rings a bell, the, say amazon.com book pages. Well, suppose you go to Amazon and you go to Barnes & Noble and you go to half a dozen other uh, book sale websites uh, and pull out all the price information and, and then uh, rank them in, by the order of where you can get the best deal on this book. Uh, what do you have then? You have bookfinder.com, uh, which actually the CEO was, or former CEO was a former student of mine. He sold it to a large company in Canada. Uh, so that kind of thing involves data mining by extracting from websites, cleaning it up, doing the information extraction, uh, sometimes storing it, but sometimes you can even do that kind of thing on the fly, uh, a per query sort of, of operation. Uh, it's obviously more efficient if you can store it and then just draw from a fixed database. Um, other things that you can, uh, you have various genre specific layouts for particular types of documents where you can be pretty sure that the big bold thing at the top of a resume is gonna be the person's name, um, followed by their address and uh, often email and phone number and that sort of thing. Um, usually all of the major topical areas are tagged so that you can extract those fairly easily. Um, and then there's non-specific things like general tables that you may want to mine from, like, uh, oh, little biographical snippets that may be included in websites. So the kinds of things that you need to consider is um, what are you going to be looking for in some of these? You may want to look for locations, in which case you may have a closed set of things like uh, the US states. And if you see one of the state names, you just automatically say that's a location, that's a state name. Uh, you may have more complex patterns of things with names followed by uh, often combinations of letters and words and so on, and often ending with a sequence of numbers representing a zip code, and say, okay, that set of things is probably an address. Um, phone numbers have a fairly regular structure, um, as do things like social security numbers, also a regular structure. 
but then there may be uh, more ambiguous patterns that need some context or other sources of evidence. Uh, proper names may or may not, or what looks like proper names, may or may not be a person. It could be an organization. It could be, uh, sometimes it's confusing uh, locations, cities in particular, uh, may have the same name as people. Uh, so, you know, Smith, Montana is not a person. It's a place. Uh, things like that. Cody, Wyoming. The, uh, so you have all those sorts of things. Um, another thing is that what you're often trying to do is extract and what you may be looking at is just, I want to just do the simple extraction and say, uh, the named people in here are people, they're persons. And locations are locations, and not worry about the relationships between these. Or you may just say, I'm interested in what is the job of the person being mentioned. So we can identify those by the relationship we're identifying, plus the names and locations or names and titles. Um, or you may try to build a whole relational structure that says um, this is going to be the succession of one CEO to another, and therefore the one who's coming in is named and the one who's going out is named. The, t the job that's changing is named and the company in which it's taking place. All of these examples come from primarily uh, a thing known as the Message Understanding Conference, or MUC. Uh, and in the MUC conference, the, the task was to go through a set of business data and extract things like uh, successions of CEOs and, and um, buyouts and acquisitions of one company buy another and figure out who was buying and who was being bought and for how much and things like that. So um, those are the kinds of things where you're, you're really doing named entity extraction. So named entity recognition involves lots of lexicons, uh, things like your list of states. You can just look it up. If this word occurs in there, then it matches. Um, that gets more difficult, I should note, when you're dealing with, for example, international uh, lists of places like uh, the World Gazetteer, for example, uh, which has something in the neighborhood of 8 million entries. And uh, you say, oh, well, this says San Jose. And the, uh, then you get back 50 items for San Jose. Uh, you know. One for California, a few others in the United States, one for every single country in South America, and often twice. Uh, so you end up, you know, you have to do a lot of additional figuring out depending on how complex your lexicon is. Um, then you may have, uh, you may pre-segment some things. Uh, actually, these are often uh, instantiated as things that kind of look for particular patterns, like name was born in place. Uh, and when you find that pattern, you can say, oh, okay, the place that Abraham Lincoln was born was Kentucky, uh, and identify that, that kind of information. Um, also, you can use sliding windows to look at the things under the window and decide uh, what class is what I'm currently looking at in. And sometimes you can't determine which class. That usually means you're between identifiable entities. And when you can identify the class, then you can uh, identify it. And sometimes those windows, you can adjust the sizes depending on what you're looking for and, and that kind of thing. And there are also boundary models, figuring out where to split up uh, you know, where does one thing begin and, and end? Uh, partly because names are a variable size. Um, you may have a name with uh, the three middle names, or you may just include the first name or the last name or whatever. So figuring out how they, how they relate. 
Um, and then there's token tagging. That's often uh, really a classification sort of problem that's undertaken. Here sometimes, and this is where we move to next, um, it looks at the process of you're in a certain state of looking at text. Um, what is the probability you go from that state of the text to another state of text? So what some of these things try to do is build hidden Markov models to model the kind of thing that you're looking for. And then when you find something that satisfies that model, you say, okay, there's my thing of Abraham Lincoln born in Kentucky. Um, so sliding windows is one way of doing it. If you're looking, if what you're intending to extract is the location of a seminar, um, you have a window which just moves across the text and says, does this match any of the places that I know about that, I, that a seminar could be? And when you finally find one that does, you say, aha, extract it. That's the location of our seminar. So with these sliding windows, it's often focused on identifying one particular type of information. Do you know if that's what Google Gmail uses for when there's like an event or whatever and it proposes you to add to your calendar because it scans the email? And do you know if they use sliding window? Or is there any Don't really know. Um, often they are doing similar sorts of processing. Um, just looking for particular sorts of patterns. Um, time and date sorts of things are, are fairly easy to spot um, because they are distinguished and you have also a limited set of days of the week and uh, numbers and so on. So then you may also want to use naive Bayes, which we have looked at before, to see if you can predict, for example, um, the, you know, what's the probability that this string equals location. And that kind of, of estimate you can use with the sliding window model to say within that sliding area, what's the probability that this is a location or a location that we know about. So again, you can create uh, naive Bayes classifiers. Again, these not my slides. So yeah, OK, this is, this is showing how, how the window can migrate. Uh, and interestingly, just using the sliding window thing, which we did before, um, it was able to identify a person name 30% of the time, a location 61% of the time, and a start time 98% of the time. I um, thought there was another one. So another approach is uh, tagging tokens. Um, this basically just looks for um, it breaks a sentence into tokens and classifies each token with a label uh, indicating what sort of entity it is part of. So you go through things and identify, um, here's a proper noun um, followed by a proper noun and we think it's a person name. Um, New York, we also identify uh, as a location name. Now, this, I should say, these, these slides don't go much into what techniques you're using behind the scenes to decide which is which. Um, I would guess that probably they're using, um, at least for location, some kind of lookup uh, table to say, uh, this is one of the states, therefore it's location. Any other thing that looks like a proper noun is a person. Um, so. For simple extraction, you can do that kind of thing. With hidden Markov models, what you can look at is the transition state 
the probability of going from one type of token to another type of token. So you have a probability that uh, a person name may reconnect to a person name and may be followed by a person name and have another person name and so on associated with it. Um, so you have sequences like that and there will be a certain probability of doing the loop or going straight or returning. Um, and then it may be followed by background information or um, the person name may be followed by a location name which may have additional terms and may eventually be followed by another person name and so on. Each one of these transitions is going to have a non-zero probability associated with it. If it's a zero probability, there won't be a transition there. Um, so any word said to be generated by the designated person name state will be a person name that gets extracted. So these hidden Markov models uh, for the transitions between term types can be used as another way of extracting information. So these can get arbitrarily complex um, and you can look at these and say, okay, we'll start here and address will be uh, 99 or 92 percent of the time will be uh, the house number followed by, let's see, 35 percent of the time by a building name or 25 percent of the time by a road or 20% of the time by an area, um, and then each of those coming to an area will be followed 67% of the time by a city, and so on. So you can build one of these hidden Markov models to help you identify addresses and which parts of addresses occur. Obviously, you have some sort of parsing rules that say a house number looks like this, and a street name looks like this, and so on. How do you tabulate those, or calculate those uh, probabilities? Is that something that comes in, like, sort of after you've gone this through is, it, it, you do ahead of time, before you go through? You generally do, you build this model ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And what you then do is use it to recognize uh, text in the, in the same pattern and extract them based on that. So it's just kind of a, a generalization of what we have learned by training this by creating this model. Um, you take a sample of data, you look at it and say, okay, you know, 92%, say we have 100 examples, uh, 92 of them started with a house number and eight of them started with the building name. So this is a representation of after you've gone through it, this is not something that you use for prediction? No, you, you basically, you train it mm -hmm. using a sample of data. And from then on, you can say, I can, I, know, I can recognize each of these individual bits. And if we find them in a, in a particular pattern, then uh, I will know that this is a, you know, a number followed by uh, a name follow, or a landmark, or well, a building followed by a landmark, or a house number followed by a road, followed by an area, followed by a city, followed by a state, followed by a pin code, zip code, um, and so on, is an address. And basically, this says you want to start here. This is your starting point, your scanning text, and you haven't, in effect, seen anything yet. Um, if the first thing you encounter is a house number, then you have probabilities of going to each one of those. If you have things to indicate to you that this is a road, perhaps a list of roads in a city or whatever, uh, or a building name. Um, sometimes for, for things like that, you may actually be using clues that you add. So uh, on campuses, instead of starting with a, uh, a house number, you would start with uh, a number, but followed by the name of the hall, so Sudarta Dai Hall. Um, and 
that would then perhaps be followed by something else uh, or go directly to an area, you know, north side of campus uh, in Berkeley and uh, California and the zip code. So that would say, okay, that, that makes a valid uh, thing. Now, if all instances are not satisfied, um, often you say, well, then it's not really an address. It's something that kind of looked like an address, but it's not really one. So yeah, look up tables for a lot of the, a lot of the elements, um, and in this case, it has look up tables for for the uh, building names, um, and so on. So in using the the hidden Markov model has two probability tables: um, the probability given a current state, uh, or given a previous state, uh, what is our current state? And uh, given a current state, what is the current word that you're looking at? Um, you can use the Viterbi method to estimate the maximum probability that's findable. And so if you apply this and use a Markov model like this in doing the same kind of recognition that we did previously just with the sliding window and naive bays, you suddenly get a considerable increase in performance. So much better at identifying speaker names, much better at identifying location, um, about the same at identifying start time. Uh, time is pretty straightforward, um, but it gi does give some, some improvements. Um, there may also be sort of low-level rules of when you're recognizing things um, you know, what are the symbols you are recognizing? And here uh, gives an example of Cohen could be Cohen uh, capitalized or not capitalized or just a sequence of, of uh, alphabetic characters, uh, the first of which is capitalized, or a sequence of alphabetic characters, uh, the first of which is capitalized, or various other patterns and possibilities for each one of these things. Um, numbers could be a number, or a pattern for numbers, or a, just a sequence of numbers, or number, uh, and so on. So um, this sort of gives you uh, various levels of, of abstraction and so on that you may want to apply. You know, are you looking for particular instances or are you just looking for patterns? Um, for, for the kinds of things we're doing back in that, back here, uh, obviously house numbers is probably a combination of uh, numbers and letters, usually starting with numbers. Uh, so, you know, 205B uh, South Hall or whatever to indicate that there's a number followed by then a name and so on. You typically use regular expressions to find those patterns? Yeah, yeah. It's usually a, a combination of regular expressions. This, uh, this is a rather dated way of representing these. Uh, for those who weren't around during the uh, Jurassic period, <laughs> the, <laughs> These, these were the ways that you indicated the characteristics of things that you were printing in COBOL programs. So, um, you know, the 999 or XXXs uh, were your patterns for printing out uh, letters or numbers. So parts of those can be extracted. Um, the, the, this was a system called Nimble and uh, it Gives, you start a sentence and then you have possibility of going to various other classes and followed by eventually an end of sentence and then repetition and transition between the different classes before you get to the end of the sentence. So um, it basically you could, uh, it allowed you to do things like uh, there were transition probabilities, so likelihoods of going from one node to another, 
but then uh, you could observe where you were at a node and if it wasn't matching what you were intending, then it also had back off rules. So you could say, okay, back up and try another direction. So it, you could figure out as you went through the thing how to, uh, to go through that. Um, symbols can be at various abstraction levels. A um, bunch of examples. And okay. So you'd like to use lots of different features of words to identify symbols. Um, uh, and let's see, lots of learning systems are not confounded by multiple non-independent features such as decision trees, neural nets, um, SVMs. The, the notion is that you replace the generative model in the hidden Markov model with a maximum entropy model to um, where the state depends on observations, what you're seeing, as opposed to uh, just predicting a way to generate a, um, an item. So you replace the generative model with a maxent model where the state depends on observations and previous state um, and rep or replace the generative model in the hidden Markov models with maximum entropy model where state depends on observations and previous state history. So not only do you look at the generative model, which was the original one we looked at, but also say, okay, unlike uh, Markov models have no memory. So, you know, each state transition you start like you don't know anything that happened before and you just go to the next one. This in effect is saying, now you have history. Now you can look back and say, oh yeah, we came from here and there and oh, so we'll probably be going there next. Uh, so you can start predicting better uh, what your item is going to be. Um, another system, the MaxPost system, uh, predicts the part of speech tags of words. It uses a maximum entropy model, as we showed, and uh, it has a very rich feature set. So this is a number of the systems that have been developed try to um, start using these maximum entropy-based uh, systems to help recognize the content. And there are also uh, some additional variations, some of which I'm not familiar with, so we'll wave hands over it and say no. So uh, you've seen sliding windows, non-sequential token tagging, sequential token tagging, um, the question is which of these are, are, are likely to work best and when? And are there other ways to formulate NER as a learning task? Um, is there a benefit from using more complex graphical models? Uh, what potentially useful information does a, non, uh, does a linear chain uh, CRF not capture? And can you combine sliding windows with a sequential model? So a one-way sliding window. Um, so with that, we have other lectures. Um, one of the ones, don't say, that Ram suggested that I point out to you is looking at the notion of abstraction or extraction as a classification process because often what you're trying to do is identify the type of information that you're extracting and not just uh, not just extract things so same idea again you're trying to fill up the slots in the database with the um, sub segments of the text and you're using um, so we saw before 
segmentation and classification are a couple of the steps that you need to do to be able to do this. Um, this is concerned with primarily text um, in a normal paragraph form and also with uh, dealing with the ambiguous patterns that occur in just straight text. So what you want to extract is not the more complex structures, but just the individual entities, which are the people, which are the locations, and so on. And also um, deal with pre-segmented candidates, so things have already been uh, segmented into uh, proper nouns, for example, or noun phrases, and perhaps dealing with the transitions between various types of, uh, of phrases. So the last message understanding conference was in 1998. <laughs> Uh, there has subsequently been another set of conferences known as ACE, which is doing much the same thing, but a more advanced version. Um, they dealt with 200 articles, so it was not huge amounts of information in their development set. It was all newswire text about aircraft accidents uh, and 200 articles in the final test um, which were launch events, um, and you were exposed to extract the names of persons, organizations, locations, <coughs> dates, times, currency, and percentages. So all of those things were supposed to be extracted. This was the results. Um, interestingly enough, the named entity recognition task was the most effective part of it, as you can see, uh, very high up there. For some of the other tasks where you were trying to fill up a template or show relations between one thing and another, didn't fare so well, considerably worse in some of these cases. So, and, and perhaps the worst was uh, co-reference down here, <laughs> um, where, it, where you were trying to find references between two items, um, specific items. So different uh, measures showed that, um, and in the set of slides that I jumped over, um, it talked a bit about this uh, many system and Proteus system and various others. Um, but as you can see, there were some systems that were pretty good that gave you, um, you know, an F major of 93. All of these uh, let you or gave you um, pretty high recall and pretty high precision uh, compared to information retrieval evaluations. These are look sky high, but again, it's a very limited database, so we hold that against them. Uh, but uh, some systems obviously didn't do all that hot uh, anyway. Um, so here's a bit about the mini system. Yes, and that's really all it says. The <coughs> math, there, there is no math included, but uh, so <laughs> the, um, this is what you get when someone hands you a bunch of slides and says, here, lecture on this. So the, um, this system um, uses basically, uh, we talked earlier about logistic regression approaches to classifying things and so on. Um, basically, the many system used a, a logistic regression based approach to try to predict uh, various things, and it, it matched each multi-word dictionary entry to a text, uh, look for token sequences, um, combine those with uh, these values with categories, and then attempted to do things like um, find places, um, 
find names that indicate particular jobs, find uh, names that indicate places or people, and so on. So. Yeah, um, features, well, we'll go, that, go back a bit. Um, the simple idea of, is to tag every token with four tags per field for person organization. Uh, it, it marks the start, continuation, and end for any um, organization or person in the text. Um, introduces for those XIs the, um, the probability that it's in a particular class, I believe, given that XI. And then uses the Viterbi model to find the uh, maximum likelihood consistent sequence where continue follows start, end follows continue or start, and so on. So the uh, tags every token. Uh, it uses a maxint logistic regression approach and regularizes by dropping rare features. Um, it extracts the, uh, again, this is the same as before. Um, and it uses, what is it using? Okay, so it, it's, it's trying to, to create this function that given a particular um, token indicator and another particular type would uh, indicate that this is a person name. So if it has a mister and a unique person name, then it's a name and so on. So um, many things that are combinations of the sort of predictive algorithms we saw in the maxant and this, this, uh, these sorts of rule-based uh, approaches to identifying patterns in the, in the incoming text. Um, so it has a dictionary of first names, a dictionary of corporate names, a dictionary of corporate names without suffixes, a uh, dictionary of colleges and universities, a dictionary of corporate suffixes, a uh, dates and times uh, is a hand-entered data source. Uh, two-letter state abbreviations and world regions. So examples they show for first names, it uses babyname.com as their source for names that people are given. Um, and for market, it uses marketguide.com for the names of corporations. Um, corporate names, it takes these and then processes them through a script which removes the suffixes like ink or limited or whatever um, so it can match else when they're not using the suffix and um, uses another website for names of universities. It uses a tipster resource. Uh, tipster, I should mention, was the um, DARPA uh, project which uh, was behind the Trek IR evaluations and the MUC conferences. So they were the funding body, in effect, uh, and organizing body for many of these evaluations um, and produced a, a large variety of different resources that could be used, like the Trek collections, the MUC collections, and so on. And had examples of dates and times. So. Uh, Wednesday is a day, and April is a month, and EST uh, for Eastern Standard Time is a time sequence, and AM and PM, and so on and so forth. Um, and then state abbreviations and world regions, so Africa, Central America, Caribbean, South America, and so on. So the... Uh, 
external seat, uh, systems feature, your idea was to run someone else's system on text for token sequences, record the start, continuation, end, and so on of each token sequence, um, combine those values with categories, um, and that became their, their model. Uh, their results in a dry run showed that compared to most systems, they were okay. Um, when they combined with some other uh, systems, they actually got better results in, um, in many cases. So anyway, the, uh, many of the kinds of things that they were looking at in some of the data were things like this, where you had uh, short news stories describing that uh, attempts at buyouts or actual buyouts or uh, leveraged buyouts and so on and so forth. So here was when Comcast tried to made a bid, unsolicited bid for Walt Disney Corporation um, and so on and so forth. Um, what it identifies is, uh, here are the names. The long versions of the names come out of their corporate database. The short versions of the names, uh, like Walt Disney or just Disney and so on, can be extracted. This was another MUX7 competitor, which used hand-coded rules for easy cases. And it's amazing the number of systems that have just sort of ad hoc hand-coded stuff uh, that works for the evaluation but not necessarily for general purpose use. Um, so it has a process of, of repeated tagging and matching for hard cases, uh, high precision rules for names where the type is clear, um, Philip Morris Incorporated, the Walt Disney Company, and partial matches to surefire rules are filtered with a Maxent classifier um, using contextual information and so on. Higher recall rules avoiding conflicts with partial match output. Um, and final partial match and filter step on <coughs> titles with different learned filter. So they got pretty good results too. This is another uh, system, yeah. <laughs> so this, this whole paper or the whole speech was mostly about those systems, which I don't know, so I can't tell you a lot about them. Um, but um, what I can tell you a bit about Hmm? Yeah, this, <coughs> since nobody in here is in my RR class, which is from 11 to 12.30, it will not be repetition for you. Um, it will be for me. So this actually comes from some slides from uh, Junichi Suji at the University of Tokyo. Well, actually, he has a joint appointment at the University of Tokyo and the University of Manchester in the UK. <coughs> which makes a heck of a commute, but he manages to do it uh, every month or so. Um, he spends a month there, then a month there, and back and forth, and so on. Um, so Tsuji and his research group at Tokyo have produced some really good tools for natural language processing. Um, very fast, very effective. And this is his kind of overview. What one thing he looks at is some of the difficulties of dealing uh, with natural language processing. S and also, since we said mentioned earlier, some of the issues of, uh, actually I should start back a little earlier. Oh, no, don't have time to start back earlier. So one of the big issues with all natural language processing techniques is this um, incomplete knowledge involved in in the data itself. Um, the 
general stages of NLP involve morphological and lexical processing. That is, ex tokenizing and examining the connections between uh, the various terms in the text. And the syntactic analysis, which shows how various parts of a sentence relate to other parts of a sentence. And finally, semantic analysis to show how uh, one thing modifies another and, and so on and so forth. And finally, then, contextually associated information, where what you're trying to do is associate this with a particular context. The issues are largely that you have incomplete sets of, if you're using dictionaries for your lexical processing and so on, they're incomplete. No matter how big your dictionary is, it's not going to incur, include every possible personal name that might exist out there. It's not going to include organization names. So these are the uh, sort of open uh, case, open, yeah, the, the uh, open class um, type of data where um, they're just not in the dictionary. And therefore, you have to use rules or something else to figure out what they are. Um, you also may have predefined aspects of information. This is what he calls the, uh, those tables and things that they were including in the examples that we just saw. So these would be uh, things that say the Walt Disney Corporation is a company and, and things like that. So from here, uh, if you're doing information extraction, you really don't need to worry about the complete domain of being able to process the semantics of every possible sentence that may ever be created. Uh, because you're really only interested in one particular domain, in one particular area that you're processing on at the time. Um, and for the context, you're only interested in the context of that particular processing as well. So it, in effect, is a reduced set of things you need to deal with and turns out to be much easier to process than trying to do total general purpose natural language processing and understanding. Um, likewise, in morphological and syntactical analysis, you can take a number of shortcuts as well. Um, what is also interesting is because you're using these predefined things, um, you can sort of determine context and then verify through your predefined information and then perhaps use that to feed back in to the processing stage to say, okay, you know, Disney means the Walt Disney Corporation, now process that, and, and so on. So in information extraction, you have domain-specific partial knowledge, the knowledge relevant to the information to be extracted. So you, if you're extracting addresses, you'll want to know names of streets, names of cities, names of uh, states, and so on. You will not need to know, um, assuming that you're only doing the United States, you will not need to know the names of all the towns in Africa. You will not need to know the names of the streets in Paris and so on. So if you can restrict your domain, you can gain a lot in this processing. Uh, then there's ambiguities. Um, many ambiguities occur in natural language processing. Uh, there may be synonyms for words and everything else, which gives you constantly diverging ways of interpreting uh, any particular sentence. If some of those things don't matter to what you're trying to extract, you can ignore them. Yes, it's ambiguous, but I don't care because I'm not extracting that. Uh, so, so it means you have simpler natural language processing techniques that can be used. And for robustness, um, you can cope easier with incomplete dictionaries, um, open class words, and so on, by uh, ignoring irrelevant parts of sentences. Just say, you know, that, that's not part of what we're interested in, throw it away. Um, and adaption techniques. You can use machine learning. You can use a trainable system of some sort 
to adapt to a particular thing. So for morphological and lexical processing, you can use some of the named entity extraction techniques we've seen, uh, named entity recognition, and to extract locations, persons, companies, organizations, position names, and so on. And that makes it simpler than doing general purpose things. And you may use domain-specific rules, simple rules that might say uh, one word followed by one or more other words followed by comma ink is a company name, even if it's not in our dictionary of company names. Uh, and Mr. capitalized word followed by or optionally followed by other capitalized words is the name of a person. Um, and <coughs> machine learning techniques, you can use the hidden Markov models, you can use decision trees, rules, and machine learning uh, to help derive this kind of information. You can also just use the general part of speech tagger to uh, extract things and deal with domain dependent information. So a system that they developed called FASTIS uh, is based on finite state automata, so it tends to be really quick um, since it's not a full-blown uh, parsing and, and uh, syntactic analysis system. And it uh, recognizes uh, multi-words and proper names. Uh, it identifies basic phrases like noun groups, verb groups, and particles. Uh, it recognizes some complex noun groups and verb groups, uh, looks for domain events, so patterns for events of interest to the application, uh, and basic templates are built. So, you know, the things that you're looking for have sort of a pattern. You can say, ah, oh, that matches my pattern. We'll extract that. Um, and then merging structures, so templates from different parts of the text are merged if they provide information about the same item. So this fastest system, in effect, does a lot of the things you want to do when named entity recognition. So yeah, the complex words and so on are part of the morphological processing. The syntactic analysis and semantic analysis is the simplified uh, versions here. Um, so to give an idea of how this is often used, and this is an example from, from uh, information retrieval, where normally uh, you take your text, you do some sort of simple processing on it uh, to have a representation that you can put into a database and then search. Um, what Strzokowski did was to actually apply natural language parsing and processing techniques so that instead of just tokenizing the words and throwing them into an index, you actually did a full-blown uh, tagging and parsing of the data. So this is the example that he uses, uh, a sentence from a, from a newspaper article that uh, former Soviet president has been a local hero ever since a Russian tank invaded Wisconsin. Uh, no, what this was really about is apparently Gorbachev gave a, uh, an old Russian tank to a town in Wisconsin who asked for it, um, which who knows why, but they did. And um, so a simple tagger goes through and in, in effect adds the type of word to each one of the items in the... Uh, in this. So this says this is a determiner, this is an adjective, this is a noun, this is a verb, this is another verb, another part of the verb, this is another determiner, another adjective, a noun, uh, RB, I think that's a relational, no, uh, an indicator, a determiner, an adjective, a noun, a verb, and another noun a noun phrase. Um, and then for IR, they tend to stem it as well after it's tagged. Parsing, however, does breaks things down to show 
how these things are separated into subjects, objects, and so on within the sentence. So this is like diagramming sentences in grammar school. Um, and each of the original words in its parsed form says that here is our subordinate clause that says since uh, a Russian tank invaded Wisconsin. Uh, so with this, the parser has done the work of saying Russian and tank are the noun phrase that you might want to use as a noun phrase. Uh, and Wisconsin is a noun that's a name, a proper noun, uh, NP. Um, and Soviet is and former are adjectives uh, and so on. And in the IR version, it basically just used that parse stuff to say, okay, these are phrases that we want to include in our index and give them higher weights than we give to the individual words. Um, so the Suji's parser does the same sort of thing using slightly different indications and a slightly different layout to show, uh, in effect, the same thing. Uh, and also gives you uh, this version of the parse, which shows not only the form of the word as it originally occurred in the sentence, but also the uh, infinitive forms or other things that have removed plurals and, and things like that. So those are the kinds of tools that are available out there for, for crunching on the text to, in effect, identify for you. Here are noun phrases that are likely to be names. Uh, and you can then just pick those out and decide, is it an organization? Is it a, uh, you know, what kind, of, what kind of name does this represent? Uh, so anyway, that was a lot about, uh, okay. I, I find this interesting anyway. Um, this was a comment on natural language processing and its use in IR. Uh, what most people think is keywords gives you the only this little view into the world of IR. And what everyone has thought for years and years is if you can get natural language processing working, you're going to get a really big door and you're going to get much better stuff. And Mark suggested, this is Mark Sanderson from Sheffield, said that actually what's really going on is we've got the big door. The keyword search and stuff is the big door. What we're going to get with natural language processing is the fine tuning of getting those extra little bits. But it's not one big gain, but it's lots of little gains here and there. So um, I think that's a nice place to end. Uh, we will, I believe, have Ram back with us next week. And uh, I think there'll be more on information extraction. Um, somebody is supposed to be uh, leading our boot camp. Is that? Maybe you didn't show up today. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. So as long as you guys are talking to each other, that's good. Uh, <laughs> so.